I'm going to take the next step in 1 Corinthians. We're not finished with the whole understanding spiritual gifts, but, but we're moving into a, a different dis- type of discussion because Paul's going to come back to that in 1 Corinthians 14. But today we're looking, beginning to look at this idea of the church as the body of Christ. You'll remember that in what we've looked at in chapter 12, verses 1 to 11, there's this and the same spirit. There's this by one spirit and over and over, one and the same, one and the same. Paul talking about the, the diversity of gifts, but the origin being the same, the one spirit. Well, he's, he's going to continue with the idea of diversity in the many members, but one body. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verses 12 through 31. We're going to read this whole passage because I want to keep it together for you to hear everything, and then we're going to start uh, taking it apart uh, today, and God willing, next Sunday. Stand with me if you would, and if you have found this in your Bible, follow along as I read. If not, we've got the text on the screen for you to follow along there. For... Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is... God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another." If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues are all apostles. And I want to read this here the way, it, the, way the force of it in the Greek text. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All do not work miracles, do they? All do not possess gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. So we've read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And this, understanding this and embracing it and applying it is critical. I said earlier, coming to know and cultivate and develop the charismata that was birthed in you when you were saved is critical to the, to the, to the powerful expression of the body. This, this too is a part of that functioning as a body. May the Lord help us to embrace this and apply it. Thank you. Please be seated. So the the previous paragraph we've looked at in in verses 4 to 11 emphasized the great diversity of gifts bestowed by the Spirit on the people of God. What we're looking at now in verses 12 to 31, uh, Paul uses an analogy of the many parts that make up the human body. 
And this is going to stress, press upon us that this diversity contributes to the essential oneness of the church. To recognize difference is the essence of bodily life. You don't treat various parts of your body the same as you treat others. The unity of the church is not that of an inorganic nature. It's not, a, uh, it's not uniformity. It's what you find in cults. If you've ever been around a cult, either had someone near to you who was involved in it or maybe you've been exposed, you know the, the, it's, it's cookie cutter. It's spit out, blurt out the same thing over and over, and the most dangerous thing that can happen in a cult is for a member to begin to think, I will never forget it, as long as I have a memory sitting in my office in Shreveport decades ago now, and two Mormon missionaries came into my office to talk, and I won't go through all the conversation, but as, as we pressed the scriptures to them, one of the two little 18-year-olds who had their, their little elder badge on, you know, elder so-and-so, one of them said to me, now, where was that last passage that you mentioned? And the other fellow said, Elder, Elder, don't ask questions. Very telling. I looked at him and said, yeah, that's right. Don't think for yourself. The last thing they want you to do is think for yourself. They want you to have group think. That's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about uniformity, cultic uniformity. We're, we're talking about this, this oneness in diversity, unity in diversity. And so it's a living organism. The church is a living organism. There's an organic structure to it. And that's why this, this analogy of body is so helpful. I want to see five things in this, this text as we, as we unpack it over the next couple of weeks. First of all, like the human body, the church is one. Now you may look at me. There may be a lot of me. But there's just one of me, all right? Just one. Secondly, like the human body, the church is made up of many members. I have all kinds of parts, working parts. Third, like the human body, the members of the church are mutually dependent. The back of my neck is dependent upon my hand being able to scratch it when it itches. There's a dependency in the body. Fourth, like the human body, the members are to feel with and for one another. I read a thing the other day that said that the little toe on our feet uh, is designed uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a GPS geolocator to discover furniture in a dimly lit room. And when that happens, and it's happened to you, it's happened to me, something happens up here in my mind. It's like, oh my goodness, that hurts so bad. Mutually, we feel with and for one another. And then fifth, every believer is part of the body of Christ, and no one is self-sufficient. No man is an island, no man stands alone. That, that, that poem that you probably learned in school back when they required you to learn poems in school. So let's unpack Let's look at number one. Like the human body, the church is one. Look, verses 12 and 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. That's interesting there because you would, you would expect for Paul to have said, so it is with the church. But what's he done here? So it is with Christ. You see, we are the body of Christ. He is the head of the church. He's the head of this church. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. He uses two analogies here. Baptized, the word there is immerse. It can't be sprinkled. It loses the force of it. Immerse and drink. Covering Absorbing, okay? So the church is an organic whole. 
And the church should be the essence of Christ. That's why Paul says it the way he says it. Just as the human body is one, so it is with Christ. You, well, shouldn't it say so it is with the church? Well, that's true, but that's not the truth he's driving home at this point. The church is the visible manifestation of Jesus Christ on earth. Now, parenthetically, Roman Catholics teach that the Pope is the visible manifestation of Christ on earth. He is the vicar of Christ. We reject that. We are the physical, visible manifestation of Jesus Christ on earth. We are Christians, little, Christianos, little Christs. And when we come together functioning as a body, we represent the, the preciousness, the power, the purity of Jesus Christ. That's why we will, we will never be as effective alone as we are together because we do not represent Christ as lone rangers. This body analogy, we've got, to, we've got to drive home. Someone who tells me, well, I, I told you this before, years ago, doing some visiting encounter, he said, you mean to tell me I have to go to church to be a Christian? I said, I've never met the first real Christian who had to go to church. Every real Christian I know says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And a person who would tell you that they're a Christian and they never plug into a local body, they never worship with those people, they never study with those people, never fellowship with those people, I would challenge them in this body analogy to say, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to cut your little finger off. Well, no, not drastic. Cut your little toe off. That way it won't bump into stuff so much. Cut your little toe off and I want you to set it over there on your, on your end table. I want you to check on it every now and then. Can you tell me what's going to happen to it? It's going to turn dark, nasty, stinky. Folks, that's what happens to anyone who thinks they're a part of the body of Christ and are always apart from the body of Christ. It's, no, it's rancid. If they do really belong to Jesus, they'll have to plug back in. If they don't, then they can be content to rot and stink because we're the body. Then he says something in verse 13 that's going to be critical to our understanding of spiritual giftedness. I'm sure that I'm not the only one who's encountered people who, when you're talking to some of, our, some, some of your friends or acquaintances who are in other communities of, of, of faith, saying, well, you're a Christian. Have you been baptized in the Spirit? Now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, anytime someone asks you that, you say, absolutely yes. This, this text says we have. What it doesn't say is what they're saying, and it doesn't say that baptism in the Spirit is speaking in tongues. This passage of Scripture absolutely, unequivocally, rejects that possibility. It says here, for in one spirit, notice the oneness and unity and diversity, in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, that was the way that, that Paul was taught to think. You were either of a Jewish extraction or non-Jewish. <laughs> well, what about the, all the different national identities. Well, they're, they're true. Who thinks? A Jew thinks Jew, non-Jew. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, that's how they divided up society. You either owned or were owned. And all were made to drink of one spirit. But when is this baptism of the spirit? Well, you read the commentaries on this, and, and they, will, they will nuance this a little differently, but I think the essence of it is, I told you before when we, were, when we were looking at the previous passage, that the manifestation of the Spirit in the book of Acts at Pentecost was confirming. So go back to the baptism of Jesus. What happened to the baptism of Jesus? 
A voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the spirit descended on him in bodily form as a dove. What was that about? Confirming. You need to learn from the scripture that the Holy Spirit shows up in a, in a manifested reality when he is confirming something that needs to be confirmed to validate the reality. You're going to see in 1 Corinthians 13 that when the Scripture was made complete, then anywhere the Scripture is complete, there is no need for that remarkable confirming reality of the Spirit. Now jump ahead just a second, but I want to show you this. Verse 13 says, by one, or in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. In the New Testament, regeneration, immersion of the spirit who, who takes us into death and brings us into life immediately was tied closely to physical immersion. Baptism in water is not the baptism of the Spirit. Regeneration is the baptism of the Spirit. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, well, I, we know this, we know that. Nic he says, Nicodemus, you don't know what you know. You must be born again in the Spirit, by the Spirit. And so that's, that's this baptism. Now, just jump forward. This is not on the, on the slide here for you, but I want you to go to the end of chapter 12 with me real quickly. We were all baptized by the Spirit into one body, but yet chapter 12, verse 30, the second part of the verse says, do all speak with tongues? And really, as I read it, read it to you, all do not speak in tongues, do they? All are baptized in the Spirit if they are saved, but not all speak in tongues. It can't be. You may have family, you may have dear friends. Folks, it cannot be. Baptism in the Spirit cannot be speaking in tongues. This passage, one chapter in the same chapter, says no. Let's move on. You get that? If you're saved, you've been baptized in the Spirit. That's what regeneration is. If you're not saved, you need to be baptized in the Spirit. Regeneration. But speaking in tongues is not the proof that you've been baptized in the Spirit. This passage disallows it. Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Get that picture? Baptized into Christ is, is regeneration. Put on Christ is that, is that picture of justification. You're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Secondly, like the human body, the church is made up of many members. Look at verses 14 to 20. The body does not consist of one member, but of many. I hope you believe this. First of all, it's not by accident that you are a member of this local body. Through various providences, God brought you to the point, having saved you, of having a certain level of conviction that you needed to plant your life here. We never speak here of adding your name to the membership roll. I'm not interested in names on a roll. When I got here, there were 1,500 names on a roll. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in people being added to the body. And if you remember, in the early days of the book of Acts, and the Lord added daily. So I'm not even so interested in, are you going to join, as have you been added? Church membership roles are filled names of people who joined, but it's the ones who've been added that you, that you see, that they, there's a pulse, there's a, there's a life 
there's a connection, there's, a, there's a, an, an idea that I am a part of the body. You are valuable. And when you're not plugged into the body, the body suffers. That's why I said last week, you don't date the church. You don't date the church. Christ loved the church. I was talking to someone about this last night. Christ loved the church, and if you love Christ, you'll love the church too. Show me a person who doesn't love his church, I'll show you a person who doesn't love Christ. It's just that simple. Because the Scripture teaches it. Plug into the body. Learn to ask the question. What opportunity to bless others will I miss if I'm not with the body? You see, the West has taught us to ask, well, what's in it for me? You will, that is not in the Scriptures. It may be in the book of Second Opinions or something, but it's not in the, in the canon of Scripture. How can I? That's over and over and over in the Scriptures. So we've got to start thinking and functioning like a body. You, if you met me in public, and say, hey, Brother Bill, how you doing? Doing pretty good. Well, where's your right hand? I left it at home. Well, that's interesting. No, you, wouldn't. you think you lost your hand. That's critical. Body. Think body. Many members. If the foot should say, well, I'm not a hand. I'm not important. Tell you what, ask Matt Morrison. Try to go somewhere with one foot. It's a whole lot easier with two. In fact, if you don't have any feet, you're limited to what you can do with your hands. See, what's, what's it in play here? Well, you see the hands. The feet in, in his day would have been covered up by a robe. It's not prominent. My hands don't sweat, typically. My feet might. This idea that there's, that there's more important members, and, and Paul blows this out of the water here. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, yet you know very well that if your ears don't work, it puts pressure on your eyes. What you got to do, what do you have to do if your ears don't work? You have to learn to read lips with your eyes. If your ears don't work, you can be going places and seeing things with your eyes, but there are things you don't hear that may cost you dearly like the car coming and honking. You see what he's doing here? He is, he is, he is he's a, dealing with Corinth's abuse of these things. In Corinth, as best we can read in the context, there were those who were, who were puffing up their gifts to the detriment and the putting down of Paul. So that's not, you're, you're absorbed in this and you're not thinking body. The church is a body. You need every member of the body. I've learned at this point in my life, you don't take for granted your little toes. The only time I feel my toes is when I stub him on something. Otherwise, I don't feel them. You don't take that for granted. I don't say, well, at least I got four more. No. You need every part of your body functioning. That's, that's the ideal. Verse 17, then he begins, he begins to drive it home. If the whole body were an eye, I mean, get that picture. I saw a cartoon recently where somebody, I don't know, they must have been having trouble with their neighbors or something. But a family had gone out and gotten this huge uh, helium balloon eye. And they put it in their tree looking into their neighbor's backyard. 
Really creepy. Paul says, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? He says, you're missing something. You're not able to fire on all of the senses that God has, has given to us. If the whole body were an ear. Another creepy picture. Where would be the sense of smell? I went through a season several years ago where I lost my sense of smell. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you or not. I don't know why yet that happened. Karen and I went to an, an, an Indian, Eastern Indian restaurant in Tulsa. And we were eating. She was saying, man, this, this stuff is delicious. And I'm going, I don't, I'm not getting a thing. I might as well be eating the menu. I mean, it's just there's no taste. You know that, don't you? If you lose your sense of smell, I mean, you can... You can chest test it sometime by just pinching your fingers over your nose and, and eating something. You lose. It's, see, it, it's connected, is the point. You lose your sense of smell, you lose, you lose significant things. You miss the sweet aroma of your wife's cooking. And you also don't have the warning system of when you might should not eat something because you smell it. And then Paul says, but God, as it is, God has arranged. This word arranged here is God has put in place the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. So we're back now to the sovereign work of God. This was, this was said in, in, the, in the previous section about how the spirit apportions as he will. The giftedness, the charismata. The same thing is true in terms of the function that you have in the body. Don't ever let the devil lie to you and tell you, well, you're just not as important. as So that is not true. If he's placed you in the body, you are critical to the health, the well-being, the function, the ministry, the movement, the power of a congregation as a body. If all were a single member, where would the body be? If it was... If it was just one big tongue, that'd be awful. You need more than a tongue. So as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Now, I want us to stop there. And God willing, be able to get into this to see that how we are mutually dependent. You may not believe this, and I, I'm going to pray for you this week if you don't, that, that we depend on you. If we depend on you, if we depend on one another, then that means that you should be dependable. If you're not dependable, you're letting the body down. If you're letting the body down, then you're not bringing God's grace in your life to bear to magnify Christ. The first century, they faced so much challenge. They were criticized, ridiculed, hunted, persecuted, put to death, exiled. It's happening today, by the way, all around the world. And they said, those people who have turned the world upside down have come here to cause trouble as well. Brothers and sisters, we need, we need a body of Christ whose very presence turns the world upside down. We live in a culture that is hateful. It is vile. It is filthy with its mouth. It's pornographic. There needs to be a body that turns the world upside down. My prayer is that we will be such a body. But it will not happen if we think we're just individual members.
our thing and, and look, when it's convenient for me, you can, count on, you can count on me if nothing else comes along. You can count on me if I don't have a conflict. No. You can count on me. Accountability means you can count on me. Dependability means you, you can depend on me. And if that's not the mindset you have, then I'm telling you you're not thinking biblically about this matter. Maybe you're thinking like a Westerner, but you're not thinking biblically. Paul has some issues with Corinth because they're not acting like a body. We should take to heart what he challenges. And so next week, God willing, we'll pick up with number three to see how we mutually depend on one another. I challenge you to go ahead and read the rest of chapter 12 this week. Read it, meditate on it, pray, Lord, search me with this. Let's see what God shows us how he strengthens us, how he brings us to repent where we need to repent, how he needs to renew where we need to renew, to recommit where we need to re recommit because we are the body of Christ if we're saved. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you in Jesus' name, and this is a powerful picture, and we know the, we know the, uh, the, the nuts and bolts reality of it with our own bodies. We, we would not think to function in, a, in our human body, the way that we look upon and expect the church to function. We wouldn't do it. So, Father, help us, first of all, to reconnect in a vital, meaningful way with the head, Jesus Christ. And then to recognize that if we love him, we'll love what he loved. He loved the church. And that we'll love the church and, and, and embrace our role as we see it unfolded in the rest of this, of this text to be intentionally, actively, aggressively the body of Christ. That we might be known as those who are turning the world upside down. For we it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.